Happy Monday, Liberty lovers, and I want to tell you about something really, really exciting that we are going to do next year, and that is attend the Libertarian National Convention in Austin, Texas. Now, myself and John Odermatt, thanks to our Patreon supporters, which you can find more about at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty, we got to attend the Libertarian National Convention in 2018. It was very exciting, very amazing to meet so many other libertarian activists in person. I highly recommend going to this event, especially because A, Austin is a really fun, cool city, and B, the 2020 Libertarian presidential candidate will be chosen at this event why wouldn't you want to be a part of that? We're hoping a lot of our fellow podcasters who joined in the last couple of years are going to be there with us, like Tom Woods, Dave Smith, Pete Quinones. We hope to see the whole Liberty Podcasting crew at this event. And while you're there, you may as well have a say in the outcome. You may as well let your voice be heard. And the only way to do that is to become a delegate to the Libertarian National Convention. And the only way to do that is to join the Libertarian Party. But the great thing about this now is if you join the Libertarian Party right now through our affiliate link, you can do so while supporting your favorite podcast. So head over to lp.org slash Lions of Liberty. We hope to see you in Austin in 2020. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. All right, my guest today is the executive director of the Ron Paul Institute. He also served as an advisor to Congressman Ron Paul from 2001 until Dr. Paul's retirement at the end of 2012. He's also the co-host and producer of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. And to add to his resume, excuse me, let me say that again. And to add to his resume, he has recently received a lifetime Twitter ban. I'm very pleased to welcome Daniel McAdams. Welcome back, Daniel McAdams, one of my very first guests. Daniel, are you ready to roar? Yes. Awesome, man. Now, we'll, we'll get into more uh, about exactly what happened with the Twitter ban in, in just a minute. But as I mentioned there, you were one of my very first guests on the show uh, back in episode five when hardly anybody had heard of me or heard of Lions of Liberty. So I'm always very appreciative to, to my original guests who just took a shot on me and, and came on because, uh, you know, I was, I was polite in an email. So I do appreciate that. But obviously, uh, we had a lot less people listening back then, back in episode five. Uh, so maybe you could do just a little recap, a little Cliff Notes version of how you came to become a libertarian, how you got involved with uh, Dr. Ron Paul and ended up in the place you are now as the executive director of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Well, well, first of all, Mark, kudos to you. I mean, you were you were out doing this before the big wave hit. You know, you were a Thank pioneer you. in the in this in this world of podcasting, and so it's uh, your success is definitely deserved. You've been working very hard for a long time, so good Thank stuff. Um, I, I became, uh, although I hate labels, I guess you could say libertarian in a way, and it just was a matter of practicality. Uh, I was writing, I was living in Europe and writing about U.S. foreign policy in the 90s under Clinton, and I was in opposition to all of Clinton's wars, and I was in strong opposition to the kinds of people that he uh, promoted in the State Department and the kinds of uh, people that the U.S. government propped up overseas. And at the time, I felt, I guess I felt sort of a conservative or something of that nature, and I thought, if we could just start uh, supporting some anti-communists, you know, some some good guys on the right, everything would be peachy keen. Uh, and then I started realizing as I was working on a book that I did in the late 90s uh, about U.S. foreign policy on that same theme, I, I finished the book and I basically, <laughs> I guess you could say, wasted a year because I realized at the end of the book that that's not the answer either. The answer is we have to support nobody. We have to be non-interventionists. And I guess it was the... Um, the war in Yugoslavia that really woke me up, not only to non-interventionism, uh, but to the whole idea that uh, of libertarianism. And I have to thank certainly Lou Rockwell and Justin Raimondo, late Justin Raimondo, for helping wake me up and really for introducing me to the ideas of a congressman from Texas called Ron Paul, who I was reading about on antiwar.com and reading about on lourockwell.com. And I thought, gosh, what a terrific guy. Most of these guys seem like boneheads. And here's a guy who is uh, who really gets it. I'm I'm here. I you know I was in former Yugoslavia. I knew what was happening, and he was just just spot on and just perfect. So it was kind of an evolution 
uh, you know, based on necessity, I guess. It's got to be some kind of, uh, you know, kicking in your own head to, to spend a year like writing a book, taking a certain <laughs> position, but by the end of it, realizing, wait, I just, well, my conclusion was completely wrong here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's weird. And now I can't, I can't get the book anyway because it's on my old Mac and I can't even <laughs> log on. So in a way it's sort of poetic justice. Like, oh yeah, you did that. Well, you can't even read it. So, so <laughs> maybe, maybe it's for the best. It's a, it's a part <laughs> of yourself. You don't want to remember so, so much. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> now, uh, Daniel, as I mentioned there, uh, you did recently, recently received the full on ban hammer over on Twitter. So uh, what what exactly happened here? You must have surely you must have threatened someone's life or, you know, done something completely outrageous. Yeah, it's so bizarre. You know, it's um, uh, and I've said it a few times. I was watching Sean Hannity and he was going on and on about how terrible the deep state is. And they're trying to take the president down. Uh, and at the end of the show, I noticed he's wearing a CIA lapel pin. And I thought, is this guy really this stupid? Who does he think the deep state is? And of course, now we'll get into it later with this Ukraine stuff. The CIA was the big whistleblower. Uh, they're the ones that have been trying to take down the president. Whatever you think of him uh, is beside the point on this particular aspect. Did, did he just buy this lapel pin at like the, the CIA gift shop? Like it's just a, a ridiculous thing to even envision of Sean Hannity wearing a, yeah, a pin for the I mean, CIA. It's, it's, yeah, it's just absurd. And so I, so I sort of called him out and said, you know, does he really think we're this stupid that we don't put two and two together when you're talking about the deep state? It is the CIA. And then in my comment under sort of calling him out, I said, you know, that he's, he's super retarded. Uh, and it's, yeah, okay, it's not a nice word. I, I happen to use it. I grew up in a different generation. Uh, uh, it's like being called a spaz or whatever. It's the kind of thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, when I was a kid, too, it was the kind of thing you said to all your friends whenever they did something stupid. And, you know, obviously I could see how some people might be offended by it. But, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not a, maybe the biggest sin you could commit either. Especially... When you consider, I mean, I, I'm sure as you know, if you look on Twitter for that word, that word is used yeah. everywhere, every day over by and everybody. Over, all the time. And, you know, one of my favorite movies is Napoleon Dynamite. You know, I just think it's a really terrific film. And, <laughs> you know, I guess I sort of like, I sort of identify with that character in a way. I don't know why. <laughs> so when I, when I say that word, I think of his voice in my head. Right. And so people that don't understand that, they may, I mean, obviously there are a lot of offensive words. There are a lot of offensive words on Twitter all the time. Uh, much worse than that, death threats, uh, you know, disgusting things, uh, attacks. So that's pretty minor in the sort of pantheon of nasty things on Twitter. Uh, but for that, I was given a ban and I appealed it saying that, you know, because the reason they gave me is because you, you cannot attack someone based on, among other things, their disability. And I said, well, this is illogical because the fact that Henry did, <laughs> does not have that disability you can't attack someone on the basis of a disability that they don't have. Maybe Twitter is claiming he does have that disability that you, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> you referenced. Ban themselves. <laughs> but then you get into this loop where you appeal this uh, decision to not reinstate you and you get the same notice that you got initially. So there's no, there's no, I don't know if it's just sort of a computer loop or if it's someone sitting there hitting, you know, reject, reject, reject over and over again when they because I've done it two or three times. You know, it's almost sort of a game like, please understand this makes no sense. You know, even if anyone is sort of they're in, they're in violation of their own terms of service because it's clearly objectively true that I did not violate the terms of service as they explained them in my suspension notice. It's objectively true. So, and it's, I mean, it's not a matter to get so hot under the collar about it. It's kind of a goofy thing, but at the end of the day, okay. Yeah, I did. I did lose a lot of, you know, what I had been working on. I've been building my brand for what it's worth. You know, sort of a snarky guy with a lot of one-liners, and people enjoyed it. And I had a lot of followers, and and I enjoyed sort of being able to snip at the heels of some of these guys like Pompeo, and to criticize U.S. foreign policy in a kind of a sarcastic way. You know, that's I mean, to have a little fun with it. But as far as I know, the entire point of Twitter is to make short, sarcastic comments. <laughs> it's designed for that. Right. So it, it is a little bit disappointing, but it also, you know, it, it, it sort of suggests a larger issue of the banning of people who don't accept government narratives. And in fact, we just put up a, a, a good piece by Kurt Nimmo uh, about how the elites will ban people that don't accept the mainstream narrative. Uh, they'll call them white supremacists and all sorts of things that are, in, that are untrue uh, as a way to silence them. And I think that's really what we are seeing. And when you see social media that is so closely tied to government funded, quote unquote, NGOs and other organizations, you get to a point where you really wonder what's going on here. 
What do you think overall about what the libertarian stance on kind of the power of big tech should be? I mean, if we just look at everything from the very pure straight down the middle, this is private property, they can do whatever they want aspect, then clearly they, of course, have a right to ban you and ban anybody from their platforms, ultimately. At the same time, at some point, we got to think and look at who really owns and controls these companies. And I believe with Twitter, uh, the government of Saudi Arabia is heavily invested in Twitter. Um, There's a lot of connections that suggest that to call it a purely private company is at least quite... So what's your take, um, kind of taking your libertarian philosophy and applying it to big tech and and how they operate and their ability to silence people in an age where so much of our communication is on the Internet? Well, it's interesting what you say about the Saudis, because I've been pretty critical of Saudi Arabia for a long time. So maybe that's who's pushing the buttons. It's a difficult it's a difficult and vexing issue, you know, particularly as someone who doesn't want the state involved in anything uh, uh, except maybe to protect us from fraud. Uh, in in a sense, that's sort of what we have here because this is a fraudulent. Uh, it's a fraudulent uh, use of their ability to ban people uh, when those people are banned for political uh, uh, reasons without being in violation of the or if the rules aren't applied evenly. You know, and I think there's a pretty good argument made, and I'm not an expert, uh, but there's a pretty good argument made as to whether these are platforms or publishers, and each of them have implications, uh, and they seem to want it both ways. They want to act like publishers and decide. Who they, who they can ban for political or ideological reasons, but at the same time, they want to pretend that they're a platform that gives everyone the opportunity to exercise their free speech. So which one is it? And that's, you know, that's one aspect. And the other aspect that's troubling, and I think we're on pretty safe territory as libertarians, which is to very, very strongly condemn their partnerships with U.S. government-funded entities like the Atlantic Council, the National Endowment for Democracy, the German Marshall Fund. These are all paid with our tax dollars, and they are used by the social media companies to decide who gets banned and who isn't, who is fake news and who isn't. So that's a real problem when our government steals our money and, 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 puts, uh, and puts tape around our mouth with it. It's, 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 I think that's a real problem. Can you speak more about the Atlantic Council specifically? Because that's the one that I believe was actually making specific recommendations to Facebook and such for who they should actually ban. And to realize that an organization like that is directly funded in ways by the U.S. government, I mean, at some point you just have to say, okay, now Facebook basically is the government in some ways. Yeah, I think there's certainly a case for that. And at least the last time I checked, and it's been a while ago, they're very open about their funding. They're very open about how they're funded by the U.S. and other Western governments, how they're funded by NATO, and how they're funded by the U.S. military industrial complex, which essentially, I think, is an arm of the U.S. government. Uh, All of these weapons manufacturers wouldn't be doing that. They wouldn't be making coffee makers if they weren't making bombs, you know. So you you do have these organizations that are in bed with them, and they're openly announcing their partnerships with Facebook, openly announcing their partnerships with Twitter. They're going to help, or they're just going to help us decide what's fake news. Well, if I say something like, hey, I'm pretty skeptical about that uh, chemical attack in Syria back in 2017, they say, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist, fake news, get him out. So, you know, these these, these events of history are subject to discussion. That's the whole point of being a free society. I don't believe what the Washington Post tells me. I'm going to look somewhere else for my info. You know, what the hell is wrong with that? Hey, friends, I got to take a quick pause here to tell you about another great libertarian podcast out there. It's called Free Man Beyond the Wall, hosted by the artist formerly known as Mance Raider, who we now know by his real name, Pete Quinones. And I got to tell you, Pete is a machine. This guy brings you a new episode of his own every single Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and he has done some absolutely fantastic in-depth interviews. He's had on everybody from Ron Paul to Thaddeus Russell to Phil Labonte, the lead singer of All That Remains, a very diverse group of guests, not always libertarians. He also did a great show with a Washington, D.C. insider lobbyist revealing a lot of the dirt that goes on behind the scenes in D.C. He has done so many interviews that I have just said, darn, I wish I did this one myself. So I really do want to highly recommend checking out Free Man Beyond the Wall. You can find it over at freemanbeyondthewall.com, as well as iTunes, Stitcher, and all those fancy podcatchers out there. Now, Daniel, it's really good timing that I have you on uh, right now, uh, th- this week particularly. 
uh, with all that's been coming out uh, with this whole hoopla about Trump and this phone call. And uh, I, I want to dig into what you know about this because I, I have a very cursory understanding of the events as, as they've been unfolding. I'm a very busy person, as you can imagine, between my actual career and podcasting. So I, I've <laughs> seen a bit here and there. But essentially, this all sprung from a, an earlier scandal uh, or a different scandal, I guess, involving Joe Biden and his son. So maybe you can kind of lay out the background a little bit and then we can get into this uh, this Trump phone call specifically. Well, actually, it's it stemmed from an even earlier scandal, Mark, and that's the U.S. coup in Ukraine in 2014. Right. Yeah. And uh, I actually did a whole big show. Um, I will I will link to my whole episode I did with Scott Horton about that. Uh, I'll, I'll link okay. to that in today's show notes. But yeah, you can you can give a brief summary of that as well. Yeah, Scott is great on that issue. You know, the U.S. fomented a coup. They wanted to overthrow uh, and I won't go into a lot of the details, but a government that they that they viewed as too pro-Russia, they wanted to bring them, suck them into the uh, the orbit of the EU and the United States, and so they fomented a coup. We know it was a coup because we saw the State Department people on the ground. Uh, we heard the phone call of Victoria Newland telling exactly what kind of government and who we want to to populate uh, each one of these ministries uh, once we get rid of this guy. Uh, we know for a fact uh, it was a coup because we have their roadmap. Uh, so that's what started it. But the one thing that people don't realize, Mark, and it's true certainly here, is that these coups are always about corruption. Yes, after this coup, the new government that the U.S. put in power uh, gave us a very sweetheart deal uh, to the son of the vice president of the United States. Here's a guy who's in there, do well. Uh, you know, the poor guy, okay, he's got substance abuse problems, whatever. He's kicked out of the military, can't seem to get his life together. You know, I mean, that happens. But here's a guy that all of a sudden gets a $50,000 a month seat on the board of a natural gas company in Ukraine, and he has no idea. He probably doesn't even know what natural gas is. Yeah, he, had, uh, he has no experience that would suggest that he was remotely qualified for that role or a $600,000 salary. Except his dad, who's oh, yes. the vice president. And, he's, and, and he set up, and it's probably worth a lot of money. He set up meetings. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's briefed his dad. Hey, dad, you know, this is what's going on there, et cetera, et cetera. So that certainly is, you know, it smacks of it smacks of corruption. And then Biden, you know, who can't keep his foot out of his mouth, is openly bragging earlier this year at a CFR event about how he called up the prosecutor general in Ukraine and said, "You better, uh, uh, you know," he told the president of Ukraine, "You better fire that prosecutor general, or you're not going to get a billion dollars in loan guarantees from the U.S." Well, that prosecutor just happened to be investigating the corruption of his son and his son's company. So, you know, it's it's pretty obvious here what's going on. And it's just one of those weird situations where the people accusing Trump of doing something have actually done it themselves before, you know, just like Hillary with the Russians. And uh, so now the, the whole issue is this phone call that the President Trump had in July with the new, then newly elected president of Ukraine, where he raised a couple of issues. Uh, and I, in fact, we also have a, a piece on our site from Moon of Alabama, which I highly recommend. Uh, and, and his main theme is that these are two things that should normally be of the public interest. What he asked Zelensky, uh, the new Ukrainian president, he asked him two things. One, do you have any more information on this server thing, uh, the CrowdStrike thing? Because if you remember, this is the whole origin of Russiagate. Uh, the, the Russians hacked this computer, the DNC computer, and put out all these emails to hurt Hillary and Trump was involved. Do you have any more information? Because we've heard rumors that that server or a copy of the server is in Ukraine, we'd like to see it. That's number one. Number two, hey, you look into this corruption thing. This corruption thing is terrible. We heard this thing about Biden's son, prosecutor getting fired. This is a serious business. That's essentially what it was. And uh, he released the transcript, which I think his detractors were hoping he would not do because it was supposedly a quid pro quo. Hey, you want some money? Here's what you have to do. And it wasn't that at all. So it's... Um, but they've nevertheless, com nevertheless committed themselves to impeachment before they even saw the transcript. It was a pretty stupid thing to do, if you ask me. And, and I say this, by the way, Mark, I am not a Trump supporter. I am not a Trump voter. Uh, uh, we did a show yesterday on the Liberty Report. Here's the things you should be investigating him for. Right. You know, all, all of these undeclared wars and these horrible, these horrible things that they're doing. 
I, I think the conundrum, uh, we as libertarians, we often find ourselves in this conundrum with Trump specifically, <laughs> where you know we do we would love to see I think Donald Trump impeach for war crimes in Yemen, uh, for so- supporting the government of Saudi Arabia, for a million other things you could probably list. But then when they try to do the, the Democrats do try to go after him, it's never about that kind of stuff because they support all of that stuff in reality. So they have to go at, at, after him about some something else altogether. And I, I'm blown away by by this whole thing. Um, not really, I guess. After the last few years, I'm not I'm not that blown away. But the fact that they're going after Trump so hard for the supposed quid pro quo, where this all emanates from Joe Biden openly admitting to quid pro quo, essentially, and laughing about it like it was just regular business because it is regular business. So, I mean, even if it was with Trump, it's no, it's at least no different than what Biden did. And as, as far as what we've seen so far, it's maybe a little bit less or, or something. It, it, it's very questionable. But I, I, it's really just um, incredible how they continue to create these new conspiracy theories while, you know, while calling everyone else a conspiracy theorist about everything else <laughs> under the sun. Yeah, it is. It's, it's incredible. I mean, I mean, it, it 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 physically pains me to agree with Trump on so many things, but on this issue, he's absolutely right. I'm, I've never seen a presidency that's been so hobbled by by scandal after another that's all turned out to be based on lies. You know, we know that he didn't collude with the Russians. We uh, we certainly there is very very good evidence that Russians didn't do anything in our elections at all. Uh, you know, all of these you know all of these things. The uh, the the the, the uh, the, the P tape, uh, all of these things, they all turned out to be lies. And he's, you know, I guess we should be grateful as libertarians that he's not able to carry out his programs because right. probably most of it's pretty bad. But at the same time, you know, it, it, it is, it is a, a dangerous thing when basically the mob can shut down, uh, can, can you know can can shut things down? Why do you think it is that there is such um, an opposition to Trump that is is I'm not gonna say it's unlike any other president. I, I don't know that would take a, I mean a lot more thought on my end, but unlike any president of recent recent times, where the opposition is obviously not political at all in, in the standard sense, because Trump's actual positions and you know that he tries to pass are really not outside the normal box of what we see from Democrats and Republicans they're pretty much right on that three by five index card yeah. that Tom Woods always talks about he's not really outside of the box on any of this stuff he seems to be carrying out all the the foreign policy wishes of neocons in many ways uh, so why is there such sort of a, a deep opposition to Trump where they to the point that they've just created so many just you know conspiracies is essentially out of nowhere to try to remove him from office as opposed to just doing the normal political thing of attacking his positions and you know to the election and on all that. Why, why is it, there seem to be such a unique opposition uh, to trying to remove Trump right now all the time uh, from what you might call the deep state? Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a visceral reaction that people have to him. And I think we saw a little bit of this during the Obama administration, certainly on, on the right, among some sure. on the right. Uh, it was personal. It was visceral. Uh, and even some of it, you know, ventured into racist territory, I think. Uh, but but to this level, to this degree, the entire opposition to Trump on the other side of the aisle having such a visceral, a blind hatred, it's hard to know exactly what to chalk it up. And, you know, and I think, uh, you know, Jeff Dice at the Mises Institute makes some, some good points when he talks about the politicization of the entire aspects of our lives. And I think that's what happened. Uh, and I think maybe social media contributes to it. Um, uh, but interpersonal relationships, family relationships, families divided over something so inconsequential to their lives as to who sits in the West Wing, who sits in the White House, who sits in the Speaker's chair. Yeah, the, this, these, <laughs> the elites in power, who, who holds those chairs is about as irrelevant as you could possibly imagine these days. When, as you point out, Mark, the two parties agree on everything that's actually important. Right. Uh, they don't differ. So it's... Um, there is a politicization of our lives, and we saw a lot of that. You know, I, I spent a lot of time studying communism, the social aspects of communism. I was actually in a country that had just gone from being communist to non-communist, and there still is the hangover of this. Everything is political. If your brother supports this guy, then he's a bad guy. Right. You know, and it's um, I don't I don't know, maybe I'm just uh, I just don't think we, I don't think it always used to be that way here. 
Yeah, maybe it's in some ways it's just sort of been the evolution of politics over the last decade or 15 years. And when you combine it with this perfect storm of social media and sort of making our brains react differently, literally changing our brains in many ways. And then you take that 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 soup and you throw a, the big uh, the big meat of Donald Trump into that pot and the thing just explodes because, you know, if anybody's going to exasperate social media and, and that sort of thing, I mean, it's Trump because no, no one does it better than Trump when it comes to lighting people off and, you know, setting off his opposition, shoring up his base. I mean, he's he's sort of a master at it in the in the sense of just the politics, not not talking about the policies involved whatsoever. So maybe this is just. I think it's almost scarier to think that this is just where politics is now. It's almost more. It would be more of a relief to think, well, this is just because of Trump and he makes everybody crazy. And you know, once we're past him, things will go back to normal. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe this is the new normal, which is you know a little bit more frightening. It is, and I think you know I think the Ron Paul campaign uh, pioneered the use of the internet as a, as a tool. To punch above your weight, at least in terms of how the mainstream media views you. And Donald Trump has certainly harnessed social media uh, in a way that's unprecedented to speak to his to his people, to his followers. And he's able to, he's able to contact them and communicate with him in a gut level that they understand. And you know, for better or worse, he's very good at it. And uh, even when I, I find myself repulsed, I'm still uh, astonished sometimes at how well he reads his followers. And that's something that the Democrats have not been able to do. And the other Republicans he shared the stage with were not able to do. They were all using the wooden language of not saying anything. And here comes this this big bull bursting through, saying all sorts of things. And sadly, now that he was president, he hasn't followed through with a lot of them, particularly on foreign policy. Uh, But you know, it was a breath of fresh air. Do you have a sense? Um, I mean, there's really no way to quantify this, but like you said, I mean, Trump did speak a lot about ending wars, bringing troops home, as as many successful presidential candidates always do on the campaign trail. It's just once they get into office that that things change. It does seem he did kind of want to, you know, make some moves in Afghanistan and, and bring troops home and, and stopping them from going to Syria, uh, at least in the beginning of his run. But then we saw more and more neocons seep into his administration. Uh, thankfully, Bolton is gone, but. It doesn't seem like he's being replaced by anyone that much better. Uh, you know, we have no. Pompeo in there. H- how much do you think that Trump kind of does have that instinct of wanting to end wars? Maybe even if it's just from his business background and, and seeing this is a waste of money. I mean, I'll take it any way I can get it as opposed to and, and, and maybe like how how much he's been influenced by the neocons as opposed to how much maybe he was always full of shit like everybody. Every other president has been. <laughs> yeah, that's tough to say. I mean, I think his I think his instinct is to not start new wars. And that, as you say, that may just be self-preservation. He knows how unpopular the wars have been. He knows how popular he became when he opposed the wars. But, you know, there's this false sense uh, that the experts are the ones that you see in the think tanks in D.C. These are the real experts. And those happen to all be neocons, you know, failed former political figures, people whose whose lifeblood is interventionism because the think tanks are funded by the military industrial complex. The military industrial complex makes billions of dollars off of war. So you're not going to bite the hand that feeds you. And, you know, uh, I was on a, a, a debate with Scott Horton and a couple of other folks uh, a couple of weeks ago. And Scott made the great point that there is a solid bench of realists. Uh, they may not be exactly non-interventionists as, as we are, but there's a solid bench of realists that the president could have drawn from. He could have picked someone like Doug McGregor to be his uh, national security advisor. Um, you know, he could have picked someone like Flint Leverett, a good conservative uh, with extensive knowledge of the Middle East and a realist perspective. There are so many good people he could have chose, but unfortunately, not only the first tiers, but the second and third tiers are, are, have been populated by neoconservatives that have a messianic Trotskyite worldview that I would I would argue is very anti-American. At this point, it seems it's almost impossible to detangle the neoconservative influence from the office of the president, no matter who's in there. It does. And these are the so-called adults in the room. It's amazing. Can you imagine any other profession where people who get something wrong every single time are still promoted? You know, only only in Washington, every single uh, every single recommendation they make backfires spectacularly. Yet somehow they're still considered the experts. Imagine if your doctor was like that, you know, he kept cutting <laughs> off the wrong limbs or something, you know. Oops, sorry, let's try kidney, another one. <laughs> wrong kidney. <laughs> you know, it's, Good thing uh, you got it's, two. it's malpractice and that's what it is. And that's, um, you know, but it's, I mean, unfortunately, you know, I stupidly picked foreign policy as my career because 
you know, as a non-interventionist, you spend your whole time saying, don't, <laughs> you know, stop, don't, right. you know, and, and so what are you for? I'm for not doing something, not for doing something. Well, that's a good segue into a couple different subjects that have been in the news this year that I, I kind of want to dig into. One of them is uh, what's going on in Venezuela uh, with uh, Maduro, who's many are calling a dictator. Uh, some are saying he was legitimately elected. Some are saying he wasn't. Uh, either way, if you're against the state, my opinion is who really cares? <laughs> but uh, e- either way, I'm, I'm kind of curious on your stance of, I-, I think one debate I often see, especially among libertarians, uh, there are, are some libertarians who you know just want to see Maduro gone because you know they they feel that having this Gaido guy in there will at least lead to freer elections and maybe a more libertarian or more free result. Whereas others uh, would just say, well, look, we you can like you can have a, an opinion about what you might like to see happen there, but to actually support them is really supporting the neocon agenda and supporting the CIA, who may, is possibly associated with Gaido. You can comment on that if you want. Um, I, I guess I'm really curious though how how you feel the influence of NGO and the American government sanctions and that sort of thing, how much that has influenced the rise of socialism in Venezuela as opposed to simply just, you know, Maduro himself and Chavez himself and, and the people that are, that are putting these policies in place for their own purposes? Well, there certainly is a history of U.S. meddling in, the, uh, in Latin America in favor of the elites, and those elites benefit greatly from their relationship with Washington, and those elites don't care much about the rest of the population. I think that's, you know, we've seen that through history. We've seen, you know, a history of bloody coups. You know, there's nobody better than Jacob Hornberg that talks about things like we've done in Guatemala and, and elsewhere. So we're not really promoting liberty when, when we do that. Uh, and there certainly will be a reaction. There will be a backlash. There will be a, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 among the population, I think that's what Chavez represented, a backlash against this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, a- attitude that the U.S. has, this paternalistic attitude toward Latin America, it'll have a reaction. And instead of doing something that would mitigate that reaction, the U.S. government does something that actually exacerbates it. We start adding sanctions. We start isolating uh, these people that we want to get rid of. Uh, and this just, uh, of course, rallies. And, and Ch- there's no one better than Chavez, uh, a very charismatic leader. It just rallies the people behind him. Uh, and he uses those, these leaders use these things to, to bolster their support, as we kind of do sometimes even with Trump, you know, and his detractors are so bad. And even though we can't stand the guy, you, you find yourselves defending him. And that's certainly true with countries who have things like national pride involved. So it's, it's you know, it's just another example where U.S. foreign policy action has the exact opposite effect from what its stated purpose is. Um, but as to the argument uh, that... Um, just getting rid of this guy and putting in our guy is going to make things move in a libertarian direction. Well, yeah, you know, history doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, back that idea up very much. They said the same thing about the Maidan in Ukraine, and they got a government a thousand times worse. They said the same thing, uh, a lot of, not a lot of libertarians, but libertarians said the same thing about Libya, get rid of this dictator, <laughs> give them their democracy. That's well, definitely worse. Different. Yeah, it's definitely worse. So if there's any place where it's worked, where things have gotten better after the U.S. gets involved in overthrows, then I would like to see it because I haven't seen it anywhere. And let's not forget, the people that are harnessing the massive power and money of our government to overthrow governments overseas are themselves not libertarians. They're anti-libertarians. So, you know, if, if, uh, if, if an anti-libertarian can foment a libertarian coup overseas, you know, I'd be happy to see it. But it just, it just doesn't work that way in the real world. And I know this is a long-winded one, Mark, but there's one other thing that I would like to point out. Sure. And that is the fact that we cannot know the intricacies of societies thousands of miles away. Right. Americans don't know the history. They don't know the language for the most part of these places. They don't understand the character uh, of the people, uh, of where they are in this sort of social evolutionary cycle. They don't know these things. So to presume that you know best for somebody Thousands of miles away. I mean, I don't presume that I know best for my, what my neighbor. I don't right. tell him what kind of car to drive, what kind of wife he should have. So to presume you could do that thousands of miles away is really the height of hubris and folly. How weird would that be if you went and knocked on your neighbor's door every night and started telling him how he should live his life and, and he didn't listen? So you uh, eventually you just started, you know, just throw a bomb at his house. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's essentially what, what we do with our foreign that's, policy. That's what it is. And, you know, uh, the, okay, maybe, maybe Venezuela would move toward a libertarian society. Maybe it won't. You know, I'm, I don't believe in uh, utopians, utopias. Mm-hmm. I'm not a utopianist. Um, some places it's just not in the DNA. And I think Jeff Dice talks about this too. 
Um, however, we could help uh, show the example that a freer market uh, produces more prosperity, which is something we both believe. We can do that by trade, by opening up trade rather than adding sanctions. So what the U.S. government does just guarantees that if there is that kernel of freedom in these places, that it won't grow. So that's why, first of all, oppose the government, oppose the government narrative when it wants to overthrow someone, even if you think that guy's a bad guy. I also want to talk a little bit about what has been going on in Hong Kong uh, with the protest there. I think in many ways on the surface, uh, you might see them holding up the, an American flag and you might see them asking for a Second Amendment and think, well, this is definitely a, a pro-freedom revolution, something we should support. But I also see a lot of uh, information come out about, like, you're an expert on these NGOs and how they have been heavily involved um, in fomenting things there. So it, it really is conflicting when you look at it from a libertarian point of view, because I want to root for people fighting for freedom. But then I see, you know, possible involvement from NGOs, which are, we know are linked to the CIA. And it really gets a little bit confusing. It's like, what am I? even supposed to believe here. So, so what's your take on that whole situation? Well, I love seeing people fighting for freedom, but I wish they'd do it a little closer to home. You know, we still have, they want to make the uh, the Freedom Act permanent. They want to make surveillance of our of our phone calls permanent. And, you know, that's what, that's what animates me a lot more than something happening in Hong Kong. But it's no conspiracy theory that the U.S. government has been bankrolling the, the opposition, the anti-Beijing opposition in Hong Kong, because we've seen the receipts. USAID uh, and, and the National Endowment for Democracy have openly uh, stated how much money they've given them over the years and the NGOs affiliated with these people. So they certainly are um, U.S. government-funded entities and supported entities. We've seen the pictures of them meeting with, with U.S. embassy personnel, consular officers uh, in Hong Kong. So they're guided. And when they come over here, who do they meet with? They meet with Pence. They meet with Pompeo. Uh, to show me anywhere else where this would happen if you're just some opposition, you're some kid opposition leader, some... It doesn't happen. Right. So the U.S. government is in favor of this happening. Uh, and that's why I reject the narrative, because I reject the U.S. government uh, intervening overseas in any way, shape or form. But, the, you know, the, the, the real issue, can you imagine if a Chinese funded a political movement in the United States determined to overthrow our current political order and system funded by the Chinese? Uh, you know, say you and I were the head of it, uh, Mark. We we're living <laughs> well off Chinese money. Every few months we go over to China to get some training and how to do it better, how to use social media to overthrow we, we the political We take photos of the head order. of Chinese intelligence, and we're all exactly, happy. And <laughs> Exactly. exactly. So what would happen, and how would we feel? I mean, I would be ticked off just as a citizen if I knew that was happening, because I don't like it. But how would the U.S. government react to something like that? And, the, and we used violence, Mark. You and I were over there busting up uh, subway trains and stuff in, right. in D.C. or something. If, if forget about it. It's not going to be accepted. So it reminds me of that old Ron Paul speech where he says, "Imagine if we had Chinese troops that were setting up bases all throughout Texas and occupied all of Texas. I mean, how would we feel? We would feel like we got invaded." So I mean, you have to sometimes look at things from from the other point of view. Yeah, and, and so so that's the case. So I'm very skeptical about it. I don't buy the narrative. There's a lot of complicated things. I'm not a China expert, but there's you know the the I've, I've read some interesting things about the you know how the, the importance of Hong Kong has diminished as mainland China has accelerated uh, in its economic development, and there are some, some, some tensions there. Who knows? But all I know is that uh, I'm not going to, uh, is this is Lou Rockwell t talking, I'm not going to agree with the government on who the Hitler of the week is. I'm just not going to buy that game. Uh, Daniel, as you know, uh, you guys at RPI, you often receive criticisms for your foreign policy views, but sometimes from places you might not expect, like from other libertarians. So uh, I, I'm sure you've heard all of this stuff before, but sometimes you'll 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 hear things like, well, at RPI, they're just supporting dictators, or you'll just hear that, oh, they're paid for by Russia because you have appeared on Russia Today on okay. RT. Uh, what are your just overall responses to the concept that when you oppose something the U.S. government does or you go on uh, a TV station that is, you know, uh, funded by an opposing government, that you are, I guess, being genuine, that you are not just doing this as a shill of some foreign government or a shill of Russia. What is your just overall response to this idea that uh, the RPI is some secret shill group for dictators around the world, which seems like a strange way for, for them to go about things. But, you know, that's just me. Yeah, I would just show them our bank account. <laughs> like, it doesn't <laughs> and pay where's well all that money? Still. Yeah. No, it's, it's really the lowest form of commentary when you can't really debate the actual issues. Uh, you know, why do I go on RT? Because RT will let me say what I want to say. They'll let me argue for non-interventionism, which I do at every opportunity. I get to argue for libertarianism. I have never gotten called uh, by the U.S. mainstream media. Well, very rarely have I been called. And a couple of times I've been called 
and I had a pre-interview where I talked about libertarian things and they said, thanks, but no thanks. So, uh, you know, yeah, will I preach it any, anywhere with, you know, with some exceptions if some crazy, you know, Nazi site, you know, called me up, I wouldn't go on, of course, sure. but um, <clears throat> within reason, I'll preach the, uh, I'll preach, I'll, I'll preach it wherever I can and I get a platform or I can talk about the things that are important to us and, and hopefully influencing people. So you're damn right I will. As to the idea that, oh, you're just a Saddam lover because you don't want to go into Iraq. Well, how did that work out? And they do the same thing over and over again. Oh, you just love Gaddafi. Oh, you just love Assad. You know, over and over again. Uh, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's getting, it's tiresome. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, find me a, a one line where Ron Paul in the entire history of his 40 year political career has ever said, you know, gosh, I really like that Saddam Hussein. I think we should keep him in power. You know, he, he, he it, it, that's that's just not obviously just not what it's about. It's interesting because if you went on, say, MSNBC with an anti-war, non-interventionist method, I, I think everyone, at least in the libertarian community, would be pretty thrilled that you got at MSNBC and got to this huge audience with this meth- message. But you could easily say, well, look at MSNBC. They have a history of supporting wars around the seas, uh, wars overseas, a history of supporting all these tyrannical things that the U.S. government has done over the years. How could you ever go on such a network? You can make this exact same argument. The fact is, if you're getting the message to more people, that's that's really what's important. It's really about the, should be about the message, should be the criticisms. Now, so if the message is, is bad, well, that's one thing to talk about. But, you know, in terms of the medium itself, I, to, if you can get to millions of people with, with a great message, I mean, I think you got to do that. And let's talk about why the U.S. mainstream media refuses to allow someone who's against war, who's not a radical lefty. You know, why, why can't we have a voice in the media? Why don't they want to hear from us? That's a real problem because they say we have the freest media around. Uh, OK, they won't let us on their mainstream. Well, we're going to start our alternative uh, you know, sites are independent news sites. Well, those get kicked off the of platform is because they're fake news. You know, they're unsubstantiated. I was just looking at, there was one fact checker organization just out of curiosity. I entered Ron Paul Institute in, and they said, first of all, they said we were far right, which is hilarious. You know, we have Dennis <laughs> Kucinich on our board. And then they said that we're steeped in conspiracy theories. We don't even believe that Assad gassed his own people. So therefore we're not a credible source of news. So if you try to found your own alternatives, you know, the sort of the punk rock ethos, I'll start my own band, even if I can't play, uh, then you're then you're still frozen out. So what is it about this message of peace, of liberty, of, of non-intervention? What, why is it so dangerous? Well, you know, as Dr. Paul says over and over, you can't stop, uh, all the armies of the world can't stop an idea whose time has come. And that's why I think we're still continuing, you know, to to appeal to people. Well, Daniel, it's been a pleasure having you back on the show. Uh, it's been far too long, so we'll try to wait uh, you know, less than six years next time we, we bring <laughs> you back on. But uh, I appreciate you coming on today, and I appreciate you coming on six years ago when I was just a fledgling podcaster trying to, to get my uh, get my roar out to people. So I really do appreciate uh, all of your appearance and all your help here uh, with Lions of Liberty. Uh, before I let you go, why don't you give a big roundup of everything you've got going on, how people can find uh, your work at the Ron Paul Institute, how people can find the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Uh, obviously, you can mention any social media you can can you want? I know you're not on Twitter anymore, but uh, you know, feel free to let people know how they can reach out to you. Well, the Ron Paul Institute is still on Twitter, thankfully, and that's that's uh, just where people uh, post the articles we put up. But RonPaulInstitute.org is our website, and we try to uh, just kind of tell you the five, you know, three or four articles that you need to read each day. Uh, and a lot of them we do write ourselves. Ron Paul Liberty Report is broadcast noon Eastern time live on YouTube at Ron Paul Liberty Report uh, every day. We'd love to see people come to our conferences. We have a conference in Washington every year. We try to do a spring conference. We're actually working with the Mises Institute, uh, doing a conference here in Lake Jackson, Texas, uh, the great metropolis of Lake Jackson, Texas, uh, coming up in November. I think the details are on Mises.org for that one. So, you know, come out, come out and see us, watch us, uh, subscribe to our YouTube, and pass it around. All right, Daniel McAdams, thanks so much for coming back on. Keep up the great work. Keep on roaring. Thank you, Mark. Roar. All right, kids, I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Daniel McAdams of the Ron Paul Institute, one of my very first guests. So it's so great to circle back. My gosh, about six years later, that is mind blowing. Uh, I do want to mention, if you didn't hear it, 
If somehow you missed it, I was on the Tom Woods show last week. How exciting is that? Uh, Tom Woods started his podcast around the same time I did, and we talked about that in the podcast. Of course, he came out swinging, doing five days a week, and already being Tom Woods, who so many libertarians already knew so well. Uh, but, you know, I've stuck around, too, and uh, I've persevered, and we are still here, mostly thanks to you. Well, entirely thanks to you. And th- entire- Without listeners, we're not doing this anymore. Uh, that's a fact. I can tell you right now, if the numbers stayed where they were for my first episode, which was like 40 downloads... Uh, we'd probably still not be doing this. So thank you to all of you who have listened to the show over the years. Of course, as you know, it's not just me here on Mondays on the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast. This is, of course, the 419th edition, which means you can find today's show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash lionsofliberty. But I also brought some friends along here, including Brian McWilliams, who hits you right in the face with the back of his hand, usually. Uh, that's a metaphor. Don't be too afraid. When he hits you with his weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty, on Electric Liberty Land, and uh, sometimes he's, he in- includes a, a little song, a little ditty like he did last week, and I'm not going to say anymore. You just got to go click back and listen to it. You don't want to miss the show, man. And then, of course, perhaps the most important show we have here in many ways, Felony Friday, hosted by John Odermatt, where he takes a hard-hitting look at the broken criminal justice system. And last week, they did a great uh, roundtable. It was a criminal justice forum that John was able to attend with uh, Larry Sharp, Amaj Ture, amongst others, and it, is, it was just a great, uh, great, great time. Almost a two hour show so a lot longer than you're used to uh, but it's worth every minute you can just let that puppy roll and hear all about the amazing work being done by so many libertarian activists and others in the criminal justice community so uh, be sure to check that out all you gotta do is hit that subscribe button and you get all this stuff for free how wonderful and of course if you do not want it to be free that is okay we have an option for that too you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash lions of liberty thanks to patreon we've been able to go to pork fest uh, go to the libertarian national convention of course, I'm planning to do that again in 2020, and we're also able to produce the documentary and live free with the help of our good friend Dan Smots from Goulash Films. You can view that. It's only 15 minutes long, guys. You can view that over at lionsofliberty.com slash live free. We made a nice, easy URL for you there. There's no excuse not to watch it unless you just hate us. And if you hate us, why are you still listening 45 minutes into the show? That makes no sense. Did you fall asleep? Wake up! Wake up, Bunchy! Uh, Anyway, folks, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Daniel McAdams. I certainly did. Uh, Tune in next week for more fun and liberty coming from me. And tune in this coming Wednesday, of course, with Brian on Electric Liberty Land. Until next time, kids. Live long! And live free.